The concept of a pathogen is a fear that has dogged humanity for as long as we have had the means to conceive of it. Even before the rise of the scientific method and the unearthing of spectra of life and biology beyond our then blinkered comprehension, the plague was a terror that befell human existence time and time again. An invisible enemy stalking us through our very bodies, too small to ward against with aught but superstition. Even after knowledge of their function was developed, humans retained our fear of viral infection. Fear and panic that, if unchecked by rationality, can become just as dangerous as the pathogen itself. That is, of course, if it can be known if its effects seen, its violations felt. What if an infection can enter a social biome, stalking unseen, growing in strength until one day it will rise up in an apocalyptic, alien horror, overwhelming all that is in a tidal wave of virally transmitted insanity? In many ways, the subject of this record functions like a viral infection, stalking the human herd oft unseen, but deadly beyond belief. Know then that this is a record of one of humanity's ultimate predators, a vector for an infection like no other, a record of the gene stealer. The gene stealer was the first element of the Tyranid species ever encountered by the Imperium, although this was not known at the time. First discovered on the moons of Imgarl, circa 550M41, they were initially believed to be a hitherto unknown but phenomenally vicious strain of xenofauna, presenting significant issues for the planetary defense forces of the main planet to contain or purge. The resemblance to creatures discovered within the depths of space hulks was noted and appended to their Ordo Xenos files, although few were the Inquisitors drawn to speculate quite how the species had managed to make it off such an isolated series of planetoids. The full connection was not possible until centuries later, when the full gargantuan mass of Hive Fleet Behemoth crashed into the eastern fringe of the Imperium making for the realm of Ultramar. At the Battle of Macrag, the Ultramarines chapter of the Adeptus Astartes led their homeworld in a heroic defense that has entered the annals of imperial legend with esteem. Although the defeat of Behemoth was won only at extreme cost. In the years of labor that followed, biologist adepts were able to draw links between the records of the Imgarl creatures and the bizarre four-armed shock troop organisms that had served as a Tyranid's vanguard on the battlefield. It was proven conclusively in the latter half of the 700s of M41 that gene stealers were of Tyranid origin. Following this revelation, and as part of a broader xenocidal procedure enacted by the Imperium in the wake of Behemoth's invasion, a detachment of Salamander's Chapter Astartes were dispatched to the moons of Yimgarl to purge the species from the volume. The xenocide included in the process the Sith, a large species akin to leeches, non-sapient, that the gene stealers had clearly been utilizing as host organisms for their reproduction. This perhaps explains the bizarre deviation from baseline gene stealers inherent in the Yimgarl strain. The pronounced tentacles of their skulls replace the mouth of the more common gene stealer strains, used to leech their prey of blood and vital fluids. The question remained, however, as to their origins, and it was most vexing. Several prominent inquisitors voiced their opinion that the Imgarl strain represented a sort of tyrannic vanguard, 
Scout organisms dispatched ahead of the main species to scout the galaxy for prey. It should be noted that at this point in history, it was believed the entirety of the Tyranid species was represented by High Fleet Behemoth alone, and that its extinction at McCrag had ended the tyrannic threat. This was, of course, dreadfully disproven in the decades to come, as High Fleet's Kraken and Leviathan began their impossibly large invasions. Lateral speculation has supposed that the gene stealers were first introduced to the galaxy by High Fleet Tiamat, itself theorized to be a self contained probe fleet targeted at a single system, after which it was named sometime in early M35. Others have pointed to the records surrounding High Fleet Ouroboros, the name appended to an unknown Xenos enemy that attacked the Helicon sector in M36. It is likely their origins will never be truly known. The base fact is that for as long as Tyranids have desired to consume the fabric of our biology, it is certain that they have been dispatching gene stealers to infiltrate, destabilize, and assess everything about us, from our society down to the roots of our DNA. The gene stealers' form and capabilities inherently speak to this. They are phenomenally designed infiltration organisms. In intelligence, they are near the equal of a human, albeit with any considerations beyond survival, predation, and subversion wholly non-existent. Their situational awareness is superlative, and their patients simply inhuman. Their bodies are able to contort and compact themselves into impossibly small spaces and gaps, providing them ample abilities to both infiltrate and, when combined with bioengineered hibernation abilities, survive seemingly unthinkably long periods in a form of biological stasis. Their presence aboard space hulks should thus come as no surprise to one's acolytes. These damnable conglomerations of space debris drifting throughout our galaxy are ideal vectors for gene stealer infection. Their appearance, usually at random, will often serve to deliver the Xenos to a human world through sheer circumstance. It is beyond doubt that many an unwary scavenger party has awoken a gene stealer subhive in their attempts to scrounge some form of wealth out of a drifting hulk always to their doom. The aliens will never hibernate without gaining total awareness of their surroundings, bending their phenomenal intelligence to mapping their surroundings entirely. This is part of what makes them superlatively dangerous. A Space Hulk's layout is madness, born of the interaction between its own physical matter and the insane depths of warp space. Within its labyrinthine dimensions, intruders must be wary of each perplexing turn, while a gene stealer knows them all by heart. The Blood Angels chapter of the Adeptus Astartes has made something of a mission of engaging in purgation operations against space hulks for this very reason. The gene stealer is one of the most insidious alien threats facing humanity, and the first company of the Blood Angels, ensconced within their Terminator armor, have endured great hardships in exterminating trace colonies of the aliens aboard many space hulks, including the Charybdis, the Immeasurable Hatred, the Sin of Damnation, the Spawn of Execration, and the Harbinger of Despair. The Gene Stealer's body betrays the hand of the hive mind in its very construction, with all the malice and sinister design that it is capable of mustering. The head is a calcium-based skeletal arrangement, human analogous in many ways, save for the distinctive ridges. The ocular organs are also disturbingly similar to human baseline patterns, spherical in shape with cone and rod photoreceptors and a retinal sheath, although post-mortem examination proves their vision capabilities extend into spectrums far beyond the eyesight of humanity. Dense musculature around the jaws speaks to their immense bite pressure and range of distension. In short, the gene stealer can open its mouth extremely wide and snap bone and metal with a clamp of their jaw. 
Further examination reveals their olfactory organs combine within their palate, indicating that the organism has a blended sense of taste and scent, and an extremely sensitive one at that. Besides the skull, however, the remainder of the gene stealer's body is an exoskeleton, the same chitin-like material commonly seen in organisms in the Tyranid macro species. The muscular strands beneath are wholly dependent on this for their structure. Should the plates be removed, the tissue rapidly loses its cohesion. Within this tissue are certain glands that magi biologists theorize exude the chitin analog as a liquid form similar to resin to fill in damage and wear in the exoskeleton as it hardens. The sheer incongruity of an endoskeletal skull and an exoskeletal body was a source of intense discourse amongst the Mechanicum and Ordoxenos subsequent to the gene stealer's initial discovery. It was only after their place within the Tyranid High Fleets was fully discovered that this was given an immediate and terrible explanation, that of the guiding tentacle of the hive mind's evolutionary designs. Further examination of their body reveals complex arrangements of organs wholly unidentifiable, even to experienced biologist adepts. The only function that can be discerned from this mass of tissue is that the creature possesses a respiratory system that features gills as well as the lung analog, allowing it to breathe underwater. For the remaining organs, only speculation can be had. Given the Xenos's phenomenal survival capabilities, conjecture has been drawn that these are bespoke organs harvested from other species by the hive mind to augment the gene stealer's abilities. This would, hopefully, explain the sheer range of pigmentation, textures, densities, and even alignments present amongst these organs. The most complex, however, remains the ovipositor, extracted from the creature's mouth for study. Taking the place of the tongue in a human form, this organ presents as a hardened column of rigid, ribbed musculature. This is the Xenos's horrific means of reproduction. The tongue thing punctures the body of an unsuspecting prey, with the ovipositor delivering a minuscule embryonic organism into the host that contains gene stealer genetic material. Dubbed the gene stealer's kiss by the more morbid of the Ordo Xenos, this process stuns the victim into unconsciousness, only to awake several hours later with no memory of the event, possessing now within them the unraveling transformative genophage that begins its work on their very DNA. It is within this blasphemous reproduction that the horror of the gene stealer truly lies. The genetic material implanted within the unsuspecting host infects and changes their reproductive organs and biology. Though they awake and return to their lives, unaware of what their very forms now contain, they are carriers of a wholly unique and utterly degenerous genetic pathogen. They continue with their existence, day to day, blithely ignoring the heresy of their own bodies, until such a time as they themselves reproduce, giving birth to a gene-stealer hybrid. These creatures are utter monsters, in form a revolting fusion of alien and human, with multiple limbs, bulging craniums, distended jaws, and chitinous plating jutting from their twisted bodies. Yet their parents do not perceive this reality, seeing their children as cherubic delights to be doted upon and lavished with care and attention. The horror of the gene stealer knows no bounds. Just as the host's biology is twisted to serve its species, so too are their brains, warped genetically such that the first hosts are utterly under the psychic thrall of their original infector. These first-generation hybrids will in turn breed and begat a second generation. Still hideous by any reasonable standards, the second generation are stooped, cretinous things, with inhuman appearances and typically at least one superfluous arm. Despite minds that are utterly alien, they now possess the ability to communicate in rudimentary low-gothic, 
and hold a more baseline comprehension of society, technology, and the day-to-day -day life of the Imperium. The third generation begat of this iteration are even more humanoid, standing far more upright than their predecessors. Vestigial limbs, if present, are weak, malformed things, easily disguised beneath bulky clothing. By the fourth generation, the Gene Stealer's offspring are now able to pass amongst Imperial society as baseline humans, albeit somewhat strange and uncanny in aspect. In many ways, the second to fourth generations are readily able to exploit humanity's utilization of and creation of mutant strains. Homo mutatus, present in all its sundry forms across the galaxy, can easily disguise alien infiltrators amongst its number. After all, beast men are far, far more, in appearance alone, divested from the purity of the human baseline than a third-generation gene-stealer hybrid. Precisely how this twisted offshoot of the gene-stealer functions is a record in and of itself. It must be stated that it, as a concept, is an unspeakable danger. The Xenos is an engineered weapon for infiltration and subversion, and with humanity has apparently found the perfect crop to reap. That is not to say that there are not other species that are capable of falling for the kiss of the Xenos. Strictly speaking, any organism with a reproductive cycle can become corrupted by the alien's genetic code. Colonies of gene stealers have been documented by Ordo Xenos agents and rogue traders amongst such species as the Crute, Terellians, the Eldari, Vespid, Greet, Tau, and even the Orcs. The pattern is relatively clear. An ambulatory, humanoid equivalent of reasonable intelligence and sapience is desirable. Space capability is another. The purpose of the gene stealer is to expand, infect, and infiltrate. They have little use for a species that is not yet capable of leaving its home planet. This being said, many of the species listed above come with their own defense mechanisms that stymie the spread of the infection. The Crute, for example, have a superlative level of control over their own generation-by-generation generation evolution. Their ability to communicate through pheromonal means often lead to members of a hunting pack that have been unknowingly infected by a gene stealer to be shunned. Even if the flock do not particularly understand why, they can sense issues within the very bodies of their kindred. This is then rooted out by the species' shaper caste, with their uncanny ability to parse the genetic codes of their own kind. The Eldari's psychic talents often lead to the discovery of the genetic curse far ahead of any true apotheosis, and their lengthy gestation cycle makes them undesirable targets to begin with. The Tau's mysterious connection to the ethereal caste often proves problematic for the creation of a gene-stealer colony, although this has apparently not stopped enterprising Earth-caste scientists from deliberately infecting subjects to observe the works of the gene-stealer reproductive cycle first hand. Orcs are perhaps second only to humans in terms of any success found by gene stealers, but they are undesirable for the Xenos strain at best. Orc genetics are wholly stable, and have been for millions of years. As one has discussed in a previous record, the Orc is essentially a biological weapon of thoroughly robust design, a fungal defense system run amok millions of years after their creation. They do not change. They don't need to. They function within every conceivable biome of the galaxy, unchanging, robust, and survivable, spontaneously generating from their psychic gestalt the knowledge and social roles needed to prosper. A gene stealer will often infect an orc host simply because there is no wetter one available. Both species dwell within space hulks quite frequently, making contact a regular affair, albeit one that more often than not ends with one side bloodily exterminating the other. If a gene stealer is awoken from standard centuries by an orc intrusion to their nest, they will often simply follow their most base instincts, 
and seek to propagate their species within this unwitting host, quite opportunistically. Feral orcs, or an orc mob that has yet to progress too far up the orcoid technological development chain, are the best targets for such infections. Orcs carrying gene-stealer genetics will shed DNA through their spore-based reproduction, producing hybrids in the immediate following generation. This very cycle presents significant issues for the propagation of a gene-stealer cult. Orcs do not shed spores until the end of their lives, meaning that hybrid birth can be staggered and sometimes random. Orcs instinctively regard the hybrids as weird and unorky, often putting them down through what one must imagine to be a genetically coded set of cultural defense mechanisms. It is not, however, impossible for a green brood to emerge, should enough hybrids be born within sufficiently short periods of time. They will, however, rarely be capable of spreading. They are shunned by other orcs, becoming the first targets for any internecine conflict that breaks out because, as one has mentioned, they are considered weird. The Ordo Xenos has speculated that a green brood for any gene-stealer patriarch is a form of a stopgap measure, a means for the patriarch to survive until a target can be found that is far more suitable. While the bulk of this record has concerned itself primarily with the more larger-scale threat of the gene-stealer, it should not be understated that they are an extremely effective combatant at a base level. A pure strain gene stealer, despite its prowess and infiltration, is a highly competent combatant. Being six limbed, akin to many other strains of the Tyranid Hive, they are able to move with the speed that these limbs will grant, or function bipedally, freeing up four limbs as combat implements, each with claws of such density and sharpness as to be able to carve through Astarte's ceramite power armor. The strain is extremely swift and agile, able to evade incoming weapons fire and maneuver through close combat with ease, especially in environs that contain any element of verticality. They are not especially robust. While slightly more armored than a more common Tyranid Gaunt, small arms fire is largely capable of debilitating and wounding them. Their lethality lies in speed, the hive mind will often deploy hordes of gene stealers as shock troops to follow an assault once a foe has expended ammunition on far more disposable strains of tyranid. A true danger, of course, comes in their ability to subvert whole societies. As one has alluded to, the structure of a gene stealer infiltration becomes deeply complex. So, one must rest until such a time as this may be committed to record. Until then, Ave Imperator, Gloria, in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.